Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the kickoff webinar event in the 2022 OSHA webinar series. Uh, I, I'm always reminded in January of the story of Sisyphus, who pushes the boulder up to the top of the hill. And when he finally gets there, it rolls back down and you start again. And I've never been more uh, keenly aware of that experience than after the 2021 webinar series, which turned into um, you know, I, way more than monthly webinar programs. There was just so much uh, major developments on the OSHA front. You know, it was an interesting time to be an OSHA defense lawyer, an interesting time, I'm sure, for all of you who have OSHA within your uh, responsibilities in the workplace. Uh, that, you know, this little uh, otherwise neglected agency is forefront uh, and very significant. And so we were glad to to help over the course of 2021 and try and keep everybody current on what was going on. And so here we are at the start of 2022, when we were hoping that we would no longer be talking about or presenting about COVID-19. But again, the boulder has rolled back to the bottom of the hill and we're doing that again. So we will, of course, today talk a little bit about COVID-19, but in general, uh, what we learned from and about OSHA in 2021, uh, which was you know, significant, always the sort of first year and the second year of a new administration, this January program is always the most interesting, you know, reviewing how things, how the pendulum has swung so significantly um, as we move from one administration to another. And then we look ahead to 2022, but really it's the balance of uh, uh, President Biden's term uh, here and what that means for OSHA uh, as we look ahead. So let's dig in. Um, and real quickly introduce the team here presenting. Um, this is not all of the partners in Con Masiel Carey's OSHA practice, uh, but the ones who are not otherwise totally overwhelmed with some other crisis uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm Eric Kahn. I'm the chair of the OSHA practice here at Con Masiel Carey. I've practiced for um, uh, over 20 years now, 22 years exclusively in the field of workplace safety and health, and I'm very pleased to to be joined today by some of my colleagues, Aaron Gelb, who heads our firm's Midwest practice out of our Chicago office, Andrew Summer, who leads our Cal OSHA and our Western States uh, DOSH practice out of uh, San Francisco, uh, Micah Smith, I see on here, yeah, is uh, leads our process safety management practice and, and otherwise sort of all, all other manner of OSHA issues. And very proud to have Lindsay DeSalvo joining us with the group of partners uh, presenting this year. Lindsay was just promoted to partner here at the firm and is the first associate that we've promoted to partner uh, in the OSHA practice uh, since we launched the firm seven years ago. So congratulations, Lindsay, and, and thanks for co-presenting uh, with us today. Uh, the topics, this has uh, become sort of a tradition, this particular presentation. Uh, we're going to review, you know, what, what has happened, what has changed, what it looks like uh, in terms of personnel involved in occupational safety and health regulation. That's both at the Department of Labor level, the OSHA uh, uh, sub-department level, as well as some major developments at the OSHA Review Commission. Then we'll get into, unfortunately, a whole section on COVID-19. Uh, that's still something we have to spend a lot of time on, unfortunately. So what's happening on the rulemaking front? and on the enforcement front, and possibly will be interrupted midstream of this presentation with big news about the Supreme Court. We're all still on the edge of our seats on what's happening with the emergency temporary standard uh, that is in the Supreme Court's hands right now. And then finally, everything other than COVID-19, what's happening on from an enforcement standpoint and a rulemaking standpoint at OSHA uh, that has not uh, exclusively limited to and focused on COVID-19. So jumping right in with organizational updates at the Department of Labor, obviously, as you transition from one administration to another, you see uh, significant um, uh, changes in personnel, the decision makers. And we've got sort of on this slide, maybe some of you have seen this, this image in this slide in various forms uh, over the last couple of years, but we just, you know, we ended the Trump administration for the first time in OSHA's history without a, a head of OSHA uh, being confirmed by the Senate. You know, that front office sat empty uh, for the entirety of the, uh, of the, of the Trump uh, presidency. The, the very, very different um, uh, process at the Biden administration, sort of, I think, thinking about how 
the two administrations prioritized OSHA or perhaps just sort of driven by the fact that COVID-19 was driving policy. It was the, the cornerstone of President Biden's um, uh, campaign and really his first year in office, an extreme focus on COVID-19 policy. And so OSHA was forced to become a higher priority, uh, perhaps explains it. But the, di the big difference was seen in that first year, really starting from literally day one. On day one, President Biden installed a acting head of OSHA, um, the principal deputy assistant secretary, uh, very quickly got in place uh, a secretary of labor. And you know, before I think even 10 months had passed, uh, had a, a Senate approved assistant secretary of labor for OSHA, something that had not, um, uh, had, not had somebody in that job for almost five full years uh, at, at that time. Uh, we also saw significant changes in terms of, sort of below the leadership at OSHA with significant new dollars going to OSHA through the, um, uh, the COVID-19 relief legislation earmarked something like $100 million more to OSHA, which would be a huge percentage of its otherwise annual budget, which was uh, directed primarily for staff to work on emergency rulemaking and staff to staff up um, their field offices for enforcement, which you know we've seen um, really as of the beginning of this administration, the lowest number of compliance safety and health officers at OSHA really since the agency has existed. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, money moved over to advance hiring. Uh, we'll talk about Doug Parker in a little bit, the new head of, uh, of OSHA. During his confirmation process, he talked about how his highest priority uh, as the head of OSHA is going to be staffing the agency back up. Um, so we're seeing money directed towards OSHA and efforts made to staff up their field offices. So let's talk about some of these people that moved into these roles very quickly in the Biden administration. On day one, on January 20th, President Biden installed Jim Frederick as the principal deputy assistant secretary of labor for OSHA. Uh, and they hacked it at the acting head of OSHA starting on the very first day of the president's term. Jim was for 25 years, um, uh, at least 25 years, the number two in workplace safety and health issues for the United Steelworkers. Um, one of the things, one of the themes I think you'll see uh, with, with some of the people um, that President Biden has put in charge of labor policy and at OSHA is deep ties to organized labor. Um, and starting, you know, with Jim, who spent most of his career with the United Steelworkers um, in, in, you know, the top uh, safety and health positions there. Uh, he served on num numerous technical safety committees, uh, industry consensus committees as the labor representative. Um, and uh, there was a, a brief period, though, after leaving the United Steelworkers, uh, that Jim was a management side safety and health consultant for first uh, ORC HSE, and then they were acquired by uh, National Safety Council. So Jim, although he has those deep sort of union ties, did have a brief period of time where he saw uh, safety and health from the perspective of the employer and industry. And so that's a fairly unique perspective to bring into the job. And Jim is somebody that we actually worked with um, bo both in his role with the United Steelworkers, collaborating with him on some rulemaking, uh, in particular the beryllium rulemaking, but also in his role as a consultant with ORC, HSE, and NSC uh, as an expert witness for some of our clients and, and other work that he did. So we, we know Jim to be very sharp, uh, bona fide safety and health professional. His credentials uh, are, are speak for themselves, um, but also somebody that understands um, sort of bridging the gap between labor and management on safety and health issues. And I think he's done a, a really solid job in his first year uh, in that job uh, at OSHA. He served in that acting head of OSHA position from day one until Doug Parker was confirmed in October. We'll talk a little bit about that. And that was a, just a hugely significant, you know, nine and a half month period of time in OSHA's history. Two emergency temporary standards. I, I don't think you can still count on two hands the total number of emergency standards that OSHA has ever issued. And, and Jim oversaw the development of two of those um, and you know, managing the, uh, the agency's response to COVID-19 that we'll, um, we'll get into in some detail in a bit. 
uh, other major characters, major um, uh, staff um, uh, involved in uh, OSH decision making, obviously the Secretary of Labor. Um, and this was another position that President Biden moved very quickly to fill. He named Marty Walsh, uh, who was at the time mayor of Boston, uh, to be his nominee for Secretary of Labor even before he took office uh, and had him confirmed by the Senate and in, uh, in the job uh, as of the end of March of 2021. So still pretty early on. Uh, um, uh, Sec Secretary Walsh, like uh, Jim Frederick, who he mentioned, has deep ties to organized labor. Uh, for a big part of his career, uh, Secretary Walsh was a major player within the um, within uh, the union scene in the Northeast, uh, culminating with his role as the president of the Laborers Union Council, I'm sorry, uh, with the uh, Boston Metro Building Constructions uh, Trade Council, which is an umbrella organization of approximately 20 local uh, trade unions in that area. Uh, in, in his role, obviously labor does a lot of things, not just OSHA, but he was obviously very much involved and, and outspoken uh, throughout the rulemaking processes for the development of those two COVID emergency standards um, and, and presumably had some role in the makeup of the, um, the political leadership team at OSHA. And that includes and is led now by Doug Parker, who was confirmed on uh, October 25th uh, to be President Biden's Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA and to head the agency. Uh, although he got involved formally as the head of the agency in October, uh, Doug Parker was named to President Biden's labor transition team again before uh, President Biden was even in office. So although he was not in a, an official capacity at the Department of Labor until his job, um, until his confirmation in October, uh, we understand that Doug was certainly involved in some of the major policy uh, decisions and the rulemaking processes to develop those two emergency standards. Um, and we saw, you know, during his confirmation hearing, he was, pardon, pardon the background noise if you can hear that, that's, uh, you know, school age children in the era of COVID wanting to participate in every webinar. Uh, but, but Doug Parker was um, uh, most recently in the job before he became the head of uh, Federal OSHA was the head of Cal OSHA. And he was the head of Cal OSHA during the time that Cal OSHA was developing its um, uh, COVID-19 emergency temporary standard. Um, and he really spearheaded that, that process. And, and that was probably the most significant development uh, at Cal OSHA during his tenure as the head of the agency. And when he was going through the confirmation process for the job to head Fed OSHA, that was obviously a, a major issue that he was examined about um, during, uh, during hearings and in private uh, interviews with, with senators. Uh, and he was steadfast throughout that process that you know, COVID was a grave danger. An emergency standard was necessary to address that. And an onerous uh, programmatic type standard like they had in California was appropriate. And if you'll sort of follow the timeline, uh, I believe he was giving that testimony, the most you know, pointed testimony about the need for an emergency standard during the summer uh, of 2021. I think it was around June or July, which was at the, the low mark of COVID-19, when we actually thought for a minute we might be coming out the other side of the pandemic, and he was still steadfast that that standard was needed. I guess his his sense there was was perhaps proven true by the the new surge in uh, Delta and then the new new surge of, of Omicron cases. Um, but that was something that he was pushing, uh, not only in his testimony, but I'm sure in the background, working with the team at OSHA to develop that. Just like Secretary Walsh and just like uh, uh, Jim Frederick, uh, Doug Parker has deep roots in organized labor. And this is, you know, one of the things that President Biden said uh, during his campaign was that he was going to, you know, give labor uh, the strongest voice that, you know, it, that, that they have had in any president's term. And if you look at the, the folks that President Biden has put in senior leadership positions, he's certainly delivering on that promise. Uh, Doug Parker, before being the head of Cal OSHA, um, was the director of WorkSafe, which is a big worker safety advocacy 
uh, organization primarily out on the West Coast. Before that, he was in a senior political position at the Mine Safety and Health Administration during the Obama-Biden uh, administration. And before that was when he was doing his work uh, uh, for uh, major uh, national unions. He was an attorney at a uh, private law firm that represented unions and did union side uh, legal work. And before that was a staff attorney for the United Mine Workers directly. So uh, again, these deep roots with organized labor, that's who's you know, leading the, um, uh, the policy making uh, at OSHA right now. So in addition to at the Department of Labor level and at the OSHA level, there's one other um, uh, set of personnel changes that we wanted to flag for your attention as being significant uh, as we look back at 2021, but more importantly, look ahead to the next few years, um, is that towards the tail end of the Trump administration, uh, two seats on the three-seat OSH Review Commission, which is the independent body um, uh, uh, that, that hears and decides OSHA appeals. So you've got a, a layer of administrative law judges who, um, who, who work under this three commissioner commission uh, that is like the Supreme Court for, for OSHA cases, although cases appeal out from the review commission to the federal courts. Towards the end of the Trump administration, one of President Trump's appointees, who was the chairman of the, um, uh, uh, of the OSH Review Commission, his term was coming up. He left a little bit early, but basically to, at, at the very end of his, um, uh, at, I'm sorry, that, that's wrong timing. Towards the end of the Trump administration, uh, Cynthia Atwood, who'd been a commissioner through multiple terms appointed by Democratic presidents, her term was expiring. And another um, then uh, uh, chairperson of the commission left early to take a job uh, with Amazon. So two seats became open uh, and in order to get um, uh, buy-in or to get Senate approval to get appointees put in place very quickly, uh, President Trump nominated and got confirmed a Democrat and a Republican uh, pairing them together to get easier confirmation, put in place Amanda Lihau who had been at the time, uh, one of the other commissioners, um, chief counsels, essentially law clerk um, for one of the other commissioners and reappointed um, Commissioner Atwood to I think a third, maybe even a fourth term on the review commission. So we had those two, the, again, three, three commissioners filling the three spots. And then at the very end uh, of the um, uh, Trump administration or the very beginning of the Biden administration, the third spot that had been the commissioner uh, appointed by uh, President Trump, that term expired. So we are sitting right now with only two commissioners, uh, Atwood and Lihau, but a third commissioner has been nominated already by President Biden, and that is uh, Susan Harthill. Uh, and Susan Harthill is a former deputy solicitor for national operations at the Department of Labor under the Obama administration. Um, and she, she has been nominated to fill that third seat. So up until this point, for about the last four years, we've had a review commission that had either two conservative commissioners and one progressive commissioner or a split of one and one. And during that time, over the last several years, we saw a bunch of really favorable, uh, employer favorable decisions. Most notably, we've written and talked a lot about a series of decisions about employer knowledge um, and, uh, and, and, and what is required by OSHA to show exposure to a hazard in machine guarding cases, that it's not enough to just say there is a piece of moving machi machinery that doesn't have a guard. It's that it has to be foreseeable exposure to that, um, to that moving part by virtue of the um, uh, normal operations and foreseeable operations of that machine. Um, so a series of favorable decisions about that, favorable decisions about successor uh, liability under the OSH Act, uh, and various other uh, issues. Now we are looking at President Biden coming in and elevating Commissioner Atwood to the chair to, to chairwoman and appointing now a second uh, thought to be more progressive commissioner to the third spot. So we're about to pivot back as soon as Ms. Harthill is confirmed to having two progressive commissioners and one conservative commissioner. And so perhaps we will see a transition back to uh, less employer-friendly decisions coming out of the Review Commission. So that's a pretty significant development as well.
So I'm going to hand things over to Micah Smith to talk us through um, OSHA's approach to COVID-19 as we transition into the Biden administration. Thanks, Eric. Um, if you're lucky, you might get to hear my grade schoolers in the background. So be forewarned about that one. Um, so uh, we won't take up too much time because I know we've put out plenty of content about COVID. And if you if you want detailed information about that, we have lots of other sources for that. Um, but if we're talking about what happened in 2021, uh, we would be remiss not to talk about COVID because it, it certainly occupied a very large space in, in OSHA's thought. Um, what I want to do here is, is try to uh, talk about this in terms of an overall narrative. Um, one of the challenges of living through history is that uh, you often don't know what's significant when it when it happens, and, and it's hard to put some actions in into context in terms of uh, what might seem like unrelated events. So, with these with the, these points here, we're just going to cover basically the entire pandemic and, and put OSHA's actions kind of into context and, and where they fit. So, um, just as a reminder, scene setting um, on January the twentieth, twenty twenty one, just uh, almost a, a full year ago. Um, if you'll recall, there were very, very few people vaccinated uh, in the United States, just a handful of healthcare workers. Um, some of the, the, the leaders in, in the government had received vaccines, but very, very few vaccines had been given at that point. Um, we were also at or just after peak cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, cases peaked uh, last winter, I think around January 10th, uh, almost 300,000 in a day. Uh, deaths peaked right, I think if I got the number right, it's January the 21st, first over 4,000 deaths. Um, and so we have to remember as, as uh, the new administration was coming in, uh, we were we were at our worst uh, so far. That We had just experienced a tremendous surge. There was help on the way, vaccines were coming, but it wasn't enough, it wasn't fast enough. And so we saw uh, right away um, a, a reinvigorated COVID-19 task force and this, this fed in from the transition team, um, and it just came uh, fairly smoothly into the administration, um, followed by a, a, a day one executive order is ordering uh, OSHA to, to um, issue a, a, a broad COVID emergency rule. Uh, so right from the beginning, we knew that uh, this administration was going to try to take action on COVID that had not um, been, been taken previously. Um, in the meantime, we saw uh, the, the administration working on expanding uh, injury and illness record keeping and reporting. The guidance there, um, putting out some more information there, um, imposing some additional requirements or kind of shaping the way those those work. Uh, we saw a COVID-19 NEP launched. Um, so we saw uh, some additional inspections with some, some guidance for the compliance officers. Um, and then also some uh, updated COVID-19 workplace guidance for, for the non-healthcare sector. So we saw a lot, a lot more information being pushed out from the administration. Um, then, then we've got a, a, a bullet here for the, the um, ETS for the healthcare industry. Um, if we just read that bullet, you, you would forget a lot of what happened in March, April, May. Uh, recall that the executive order was to was for OSHA to issue a broad um, ETS for COVID. And if you go back and read our, our, our blog posts and some things that we were seeing out of the administration, uh, it seemed very clear that, that OSHA was working on a general industry ETS. But with the, the, um, the fairly successful rollout of vaccines in March, April, May, uh, lowering cases. If you remember, if your, your kids played sports, you may remember that some of the uh, on-field restrictions got, got rolled back uh, from March to April to May. I know we saw that. Um, and so as OSHA got closer to issuing their, their emergency rule, uh, there began, began to be some back and forth about whether it was actually needed uh, and some, some pushback. Uh, and I, I think if you Look at our blog you'll see that we were commenting that we were expecting it to be issued but it looked like it was pulled it was delayed things were happening there were in internal negotiations and and what we got from that from that drop in cases uh was an ets but only for healthcare, and that seemed to be justified because um general uh, cases in, in the public were, were quite a bit lower uh we seemed to be successful but osha felt that it was still important to to roll out an ets for healthcare. So that was issued. Um, we worked pretty hard in the summer to help our healthcare clients um, figure out how to comply with that. And then, 
you know, right after that, uh, we, we got to we got to enjoy the uh, the Delta surge starting um, in, I guess, late June, July, and suddenly, um, what had seemed like a pandemic that was essentially over uh, wasn't. And so, if you look back at some of the timing that that Eric was talking about with uh, Doug Parker being nominated and eventually confirmed, uh, you see that that things stack up so that we we had a healthcare ETS issued followed by a, a surge in cases, um, hospitalizations going up again, case counts going up again, um, some states rolling um, um, restrictions back into place, and uh, Doug Parker being added to the administration, and all of a sudden this general industry ETS that had seemed dead in the water, it came back, and uh, OSHA took action, uh, and I think they saw, they saw whether it was you know, initiated by Doug Parker or more by events on the ground, um, they saw that there was still a, some some need for it. And so that's where we saw the um, the general industry ETS um, issued, I think it was early November. Um, we, it could have been issued earlier. We were expecting it probably any day from, you know, late September to early October, but it finally was issued in November, uh, November 21. Um, and of course, as these things happen, um, by the time OSHA got that issued in November um, of last year, case counts were back down. Uh, October was a pretty quiet month for uh, COVID cases. It, things were pretty calm. And so uh, we get the new ETS, you get a lot of lit litigation, you get the ETS stayed by the Fifth Circuit, litigation transferred to the Sixth, sixth Circuit. Um, and just in time for the, uh, for the litigation to really take off, uh, we get the Omicron variant, the surge, um, yeah, just rolling out, uh, and case counts go way back up. Uh, and, and so now the Supreme Court litigation is taking place in, in a world where uh, it's, uh, cases aren't at a low. Um, they're actually at an all-time high now, so we're higher than we were uh, a year ago. So um, I think it's important to kind of put all this into context and seeing o OSHA's actions uh, because of course, what we what we're looking at is what, what's OSHA going to do this year? Um, what's going to happen? What, what are their next steps? Uh, and I think that where where we're standing in terms of of cases and with the rule and litigation, we are of course all waiting and and refreshing um, frantically for news to see when the Supreme Court is going to issue a decision on uh, the ETS stay. Um, but I, I think we're going to see OSHA continuing to push uh, their COVID enforcement, um, moving ahead with um, um, uh, inspections, uh, guidance, and all things along those lines. So um, we will keep watching this space in the in the coming year. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll we'll see more. There's still going to be a lot a lot to talk about. Um, will we see COVID become endemic in the next couple of months, or, or do we have you know, multiple more surges uh, and and variants to deal with? So. Um, that's a view of what's happened. Uh, I think we'll we'll give you some more guidance in COVID-specific um, uh, webinars and blog posts. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Andrew to talk a little bit about how things have been done in California. Thank you, Micah. Uh, in California, we were really in the forefront over the uh, ETS, uh, COVID-19 rulemaking for better or for worse. and want to give you a brief overview uh, of the uh, ETS rulemaking in California, as well as the current status. Uh, the ETS in California for COVID-19 was uh, passed. Um, it was, there was a rulemaking process in the fall of 2020. It became effective on November 30th, 2020. Uh, it was a valiant effort uh, given the unprecedented nature of the pandemic and the number of considerations, but Unfortunately, it, it did become an example of, of how not to uh, conduct rulemaking, and it became this extremely verbose, complex uh, standard that no one could really understand, uh, whether it be employers or uh, Cal OSHA, the enforcement agency itself. And so we, we've been involved in this process from the very start. We um, have, our, our firm has served on the advisory committee uh, for the uh, Cal OSHA ETS and proposed permanent uh, rulemaking over COVID-19 uh, measures. And uh, the, the initial, from what we've seen in this whole process is you have this uh, particularly intricate 
uh, standard that was enacted early on, and it took multiple rounds of uh, frequently asked questions uh, with answers posted on DOSH's website to try to understand how the agency was interpreting uh, the rule. And uh, over time, we started to get a, a better grasp of what was being expected of employers. It was still quite onerous. And there, the, the standard requires, as many of you know, a, uh, a freestanding program document uh, for COVID-19 prevention, as well as various measures in place, whether it be administrative and engineering controls, uh, contact tracing, uh, outbreak testing, things of that nature. And so the core components is the it involves the uh, COVID-19 prevention measures for the general workforce, and it applies to uh, almost all workplace uh, scenarios. And then there are sections uh, addressing outbreaks as well as employer-provided housing and transportation. Then uh, in uh, the uh, uh, middle of 2021, uh, there was movement to uh, amend the uh, COVID-19 rule for readoption. It was considered the first readoption under uh, California's emergency rulemaking process. And there, 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 there was a, a drama that we don't have time to address today around that rulemaking process, but ultimately um, with some pressure um, uh, within the state, there, there were some changes to provide um, exemptions for fully vaccinated employees uh, where they are a close contact from testing and exclusion. And there was also a removal of the physical distancing requirements in the workplace, uh, as well as changing the face covering requirements. So that did not apply to employees that were fully vaccinated. Uh, then when that version of the ETS was up for uh, reconsideration as part of the uh, readoption that's required, uh, and there was the second readoption. There were changes removing many of those exceptions for fully vaccinated employees, uh, to the dismay of of, uh, of many, uh, for uh, employees that are close contacts, as well as for, you know related to testing, as well as exclusion. Uh, and then there was the uh, there was a second readoption that um, is taking effect on January fourteenth. And that readoption uh, uh, is created some complications around isolate, isolation and quarantine for individuals that are fully vaccinated. And there's a number of details with that. Uh, but in a nutshell, it became more restrictive uh, than the prior iteration of the ETS. Uh, but then the California Department of Public Health, on the heels of CDC guidance on isolation and quarantine, uh, uh, came out with some guidance uh, that provides um, greater latitude to bring employees back to work after they test positive for COVID and need to be isolated or they uh, experience a close contact. And that guidance was just uh, recognized in FAQs by DOSH. It's, um, there's been a little bit of loosening on that. There's some ambiguities about what it's really intended to mean. Uh, and then at the same time, the governor has signed an executive order extending the uh, rulemaking process for the emergency rule through the end of uh, the year of 2022. Otherwise, it, the emergency rule would need to end earlier. Uh, and so then moving to the next slide, uh, the path forward here, uh, there, you know, first starting with the Fed OSHA uh, vaccinate or test ETS, uh, California is proceeding with what's called Horcher adoption, which is essentially adopting verbatim the Fed OSHA ETS so that it's this truncated rulemaking process and it can be essentially uh, adopted and implemented in, in California quite quickly. Uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, is that the, the state is proceeding uh, cautiously or the standards board is. And if the Supreme Court intervenes to stay or invalidate the Fed OSHA ETS, we would expect that uh, the Standards Board in California would, would uh, shelf uh, the Fed OSHA ETS for consideration. Otherwise, the path in California is to extend, um, is one option is to extend the prescriptive COVID-19 ETS through the end of 2022, and then consider a potential uh, permanent rule. 
And we, we did have advisory committee over the permanent rule and the permanent rule uh, adopts many parts of the ETS, but has removed the COVID-19 program document requirements. So essentially there'd be a more performance-based approach for, uh, for general compliance with the standard where you could use your IIPP, Injury and Illness Prevention Program for that, but then there'd be a number of additional very specific requirements. Although it is called a permanent rule, uh, presently uh, the draft uh, provides for a two year sunset. So it'd be in effect for two years. And we're continuing through that consideration through the rulemaking process. Uh, and so there was a lively discussion on this at, at one of the last uh, standard board meetings in California. And it's clear that uh, the, the labor, the unions are, are uh, aligning or lining up in, in support of a very specific prescriptive rule like we have under the ETS uh, and may have under a permanent rule. And the employ employer community is, uh, is in favor generally uh, of a more uh, fluid performance-based standard like the Injury and Illness Prevention Program uh, standard for compliance. And the reason is, is that standard is fairly flexible and allows us to modify or the approach that an employer takes dependent on the nature of the hazard associated with the pandemic. And as we've seen, as Mike alluded to, the, this has been an evolving pandemic with different variants and, 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 and scientific knowledge. And the idea is that we uh, will need the flexibility to modify the prevention measures in place depending on what the known hazards are and how we can actually address them. Uh, the last option is to entirely uh, scrap the COVID-19 ETS, and, and that's, you know, as I mentioned, to adopt the IAPP standard. Um, and this will be something that will be further debated, debated at the standards board level in the months to come. Um, and with that, I will uh, hand it over to the next speaker, that I believe is Aaron. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so we're gonna, gonna move uh, somewhat quickly through the next uh, four slides just to uh, cover some enforcement trends and data and uh, I, I will be the bearer of some bad news, which I think most of you, if not all of you, expect to hear. And the, the first is about the uh, anticipated or projected penalty increase that, that will be coming, we think, any day. We have not heard yet from OSHA what the number will be. Uh, usually in past years, we have, have gotten some information in, in regards to that projected number. Um, historically, and since the, the number has been changing each year uh, since 2016, since the, the structure was changed in 2016 to align uh, with, with inflationary costs, uh, we saw, I think as I just announced either today or yesterday, that the consumer price index rose about 7% uh, in the past year, which was the largest increase since 1982. Um, I still remember the 80s. I, I'm sure a number of our, uh, the folks listening uh, and joining us today may not have been alive back then. Uh, so it's a big deal. It's gone up a lot. And that means your penalties uh, have the potential to go up a lot. Um, so when, when OSHA made that big jump back in 2016, uh, moving from 7,000 for serious or other than serious citations to 12,471, you can see it's taken from 2016 uh, until 2021, and we, we really only increased about a thousand, just a little over a thousand dollars, with the max penalty last year being 13,653. Uh, now we are looking at with this significant increase in the consumer price index, uh, jumping almost a thousand dollars in one year, um, with with the max penalty going up to potentially up to 14,581 for a serious or other than serious citation. Obviously, that that increase then is is magnified with respect to willful and repeat citations, which can come with a penalty of up to 100, uh, possibly up to 145,816 dollars. Uh, and if if you uh, heard us talk about why we are we are so we so concerned, particularly about repeat citations, and, and Lindsay will talk about that in a few minutes. Um, you know that that's where the rubber meets the road, and you get three of those, and now you're looking at close to a $500,000 penalty. Um, and I don't, I, I'd be remiss to not mention uh, and flag the potential for significant penalties under failure to abate. 
Um, when you when you think about, well, okay, a $14,581 fine for a serious citation, but when it's up to that amount per day for a failure to abate, and we know that the area offices don't always get back to you right away if they don't think you've abated. Um, we were retained last year by a, a small employer that got uh, well into a six-figure uh, failure to abate citation. They didn't even know it was coming. Um, we were able, after we were retained, to, to negotiate, uh, I'd say, close to an 85% penalty reduction. But it just illustrates how, uh, how much power that the agency has if they're going to, to hit an employer with a failure to abate citation when it can reach uh, almost $15,000 per day. So we'll be watching that closely uh, when that when that data comes out. Uh, you can rest assured that we'll we'll be updating everyone. I'm sure it'll be up on our blog, the OSHA Defense Report. So so check back there. Um, moving on to the next slide, and and um, when Micah talked about living through history, uh, it reminded me of as, as an American history major uh, back when the, the the founders were drafting the the Declaration and the Constitution. And many people know that they were keeping journals because they knew what they were doing was significant. It may not have been it'd be difficult to know certain aspects of COVID if it was the same thing. This this law uh, with the Build Back Better law, there's this this little hidden nugget in there that has the potential to uh, increase OSHA penalties by 500 percent. And uh, you don't need to be a historian to know how significant that would be. Um, that would be a change that at the time that we're living through that, we know what a big deal that would be. So um, if, if you're suddenly then looking at, you know, four or five lotto or machine guarding citations after an amputation, uh, you know, okay, you get four or five of those and they're 12 to 13,000, 10 to $13,000 fines. That's significant, but it's, it's not, it's not something that's going to really draw necessarily a lot of attention. But if it's now seventy thousand dollars just for, for for up to a for a serious citation, you're now looking at a regular regular uh, occurrences of six uh, or six figure citations, and then really big news uh, that that could result in an increase in willful repeat fines of up to seven hundred thousand dollars. And so those of you that that have operations in Canada. You know how how significant their OHS system is. Um, the, the also greater increase for for criminal prosecutions, which we'll talk a little bit about later as well. Um, so this this is something that that would be, I think, it, it result in seismic changes in in the OSHA world and uh, the OSHA bar, how we practice, how our clients approach inspections, uh, the resources that that are are, are invested in those in defending those inspections. So. Um, I, we, I think we recognize that this, this law is currently, uh, on, I guess, on life support, whether or not it, it passes, whether that this portion of, of the bill remains in it. Um, but it is something that, that we are tracking very closely. And the other, the other piece that's included in there is a, a very significant increase in the agency's bud, in, in OSHA's budget, which obviously also has uh, the, the potential to results in some significant changes, primarily with the, the hiring of a significantly larger number of compliance officers. Um, we all know how limited staffing is at the agency. And the ability to get into and inspect your workplaces is, is, is directly related to how many compliance officers there are. And so the agency has the, the ability at some point to significantly staff up in that area. We'll see more inspections, uh, which is a good segue then to the next slide. I know a lot of folks uh, who turn in tune into our um, our annual updates like to get the the data that, that we download for you all. Uh, so just looking at this slide, uh, first year of the Biden administration uh, saw OSHA conduct uh, twenty four thousand three hundred fifty eight inspections, which was uh, a slight increase over the final year of the Trump administration doesn't take a, an infectious disease expert or a rocket science to scientist to figure out why those numbers are so low, right? For, for much of 2020, OSHA wasn't doing any in-person inspections. Um, I, I think I, I handled the first in-person inspection in, in the Chicagoland region, uh, at least I was told by, by the regional office in back in, in May or June uh, that no one had, had even been into a, a factory or, or a facility for three, four months. Uh, and that was only under extenuating circumstances that, that they decided to go in. If you've been 
been on inspections with OSHA, you know, they, they come in now, they conduct their job hazard analysis focused on COVID. Um, that they're in some cases decked out in some pretty elaborate PPE setups uh, that sometimes have the tendency to scare all the employees who are not wearing similar uh, equipment. Um, but but they are not they are being and still I think relatively judicious about when they go out, which which workplaces they they inspect. Certainly relying on uh, the, the notice of alleged hazard letters more than they have in the past, at least in, in my experience here in the Midwest. So we are seeing uh, fewer inspections, although um, now with, with majority, I think if not all or most compliance officers vaccinated, um, we are seeing some return to normalcy uh, in that regard. So I do expect that number to increase uh, again in 2022. And then the number I think that was most surprising to me, if turning to the next slide, which focuses on the total violations issued, uh, to see uh, almost 9,000 fewer citations issued in 2021, uh, even than in 2020, uh, was, was particularly uh, surprising. I think there are a number of factors that we've been talking about why that may be. I, I would say just based on personal experience of, of all the inspections that I have been on in the last year, uh, we are seeing far more of the get in and get out type of inspection, uh, even in, in ones that are, are relatively significant incidents. Um, you know, the compl most compliance officers that I've worked with do not want to be in these workplaces. Um, they, 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 they focus on what which is good news for our clients, right? The, the scope of what the inspection should be. If you listen to our managing uh, inspections webinars, you know how we always talk about managing the scope of the inspection. And I, I've, I've fielded far fewer uh, requests from compliance officers that where they want to expand, go into other areas, other departments, look at other issues. Um, I've, I've had compliance officers on an amputation inspection who see a forklift. They say, yeah, normally we've got an emphasis program. I should be expanding this into forklifts, but just send me your forklift program and that's all I need. Um, so there, there definitely does not seem to be that same inclination to expand and look into other areas. Um, they'll they uh, typically take those, take some photographs, do a couple witness interviews and they're gone. Uh, so I think that, that that is a big reason uh, why we're, we, we saw such a significant decrease in the number of inspections, or I should say the number of violations issued last year. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to my new partner, uh, Lindsay DeSalvo, uh, who will present a few more statistics and talk about repeat citations. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, we have a, a couple more slides on just some important stats that we wanted to review, and then um, just some quick points on the repeat policy. Um, so first on this slide, we have about the same average penalty that we saw for serious violations in 2021. Uh, probably not surprisingly, serious violations are generally the most common type of violations issued during an inspection. And we think this type of data is important to understand because I think it's usually around 75 to 78% of inspections generally result in citations. Um, and since serious penalties are the most common, it's, it's good to have an understanding of what sort of penalty amount you might see. You know, Aaron just reviewed what the uh, top penalty amounts are and what they're likely to be in 2022 for serious violations. And as you can see, the average amount generally is a little bit below that midway point of the range of penalty amount for a serious violation. Um, but that's not to say that depending on the circumstances, you can face a higher penalty amount for a serious violation. But this is generally what we're seeing. Um, it's pretty consistent with what it's been in prior years. You'll notice that there was a a big jump from 2015 to 2017, and then even more so in 2018, which is reflective of when the new significant increase in penalties went into effect. Um, and so since that time, it's, cons it's stayed cons pretty consistent around $5,000, a little bit more than $5,000 um, for serious penalties. On the next slide, which is our final statistics slide, uh, we just want to take a quick look at the significant penalty cases, so penalty cases of $100,000 or more. 
uh, you'll notice that in that there was a pretty significant increase in 2021, which probably also takes into account the fact that there wasn't as much enforcement action happening generally in 2020. Um, but there was a significant increase in these high penalty cases in 2021. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's important to know because we do see that likely to continuing to be the trend during the Biden administration. Again, you'll see looking at this chart of the last 11 years that the biggest amount, uh, the biggest increase and the largest amount of these types of cases occurred in 2017. Again, likely tied to that significant increase in penalty amount overall. Um, and then it's sort of dipped down from there and is now seeming to increase again. And as Aaron said, you know, we do think that there is going to be a lot more significant enforcement action this year and into the coming years of the Biden administration. There's more resources being put toward enforcement now. So it is likely that we will see this number continue to increase um, this coming year as well as going forward. So just real quick, um, we always in this presentation like to touch on the repeat violation policy, because as Aaron mentioned, um, you know, in talking about the increase in penalties, repeat violations have a significant penalty amount potentially associated with them. And we tend to see repeat violations more often than we do willful violations, which also have, you know, a similar top penalty amount. Um, because of the fact that repeat violations are really just triggered by having a prior violation in a final order on the employer's record. You don't need to have sort of that added, um, you know, a serious case or serious in incident or something like that that, that might trigger a willful violation, um, digging into sort of you know, the history of the employer. It's really just having this violation on the record. So we, are see, we see repeat violations more often. And so I think it's worthwhile to touch on the current policy. Um, and this slide just shows that historically, uh, workplaces were being treated as individual in independent establishments by OSHA. So the repeat potential wasn't as great. Um, OSHA initially was using a three-year look back period, again, limiting the potential for repeat violation based on an employer's record and it was more reactive. But now what we're seeing, what we saw under in the Obama administration and what we're also seeing now in the Biden administration, unsurprisingly, a uh, very similar approach, is that the um, corporations overall are being treated as a family. And so if one workplace in a corporation is cited, OSHA might potentially, particularly federal OSHA, where they you know, operate in multiple states nationwide, could use what happened at one facility within a corporate family to support a repeat violation at a separate facility. Um, and so that expands the potential for repeat violations being issued. And then the look back period that is being used in the Biden administration also expands the um, potential for receiving a repeat violation. So. OSHA under Biden uses a five-year look-back period to assess an employer's record and could use a violation from a final order uh, on that record going back, you know, now to 2017. If there's a violation there, they could use that as the basis for a repeat violation. Um, so it's just kind of important to sort of understand the context for repeat violations. And then the last slide here, you go to the next slide. Um, this shows the statistics on repeat violations. And again, you know, just sort of emphasizing the fact that the instances of repeat violations being issued has generally increased over the years. Uh, in 2021, we saw that repeat violations made up about 5.7% of the violations issued. And again, this is important from, you know, sort of an assessment of how to proceed when citations are issued. Not only could there be a significant penalty attached to repeat violation, but receiving multiple repeat violations, depending on the standards that are cited, could result in an employer um, being admitted to OSHA's severe violator enforcement program, which could have some pretty significant potential impacts on the employer. 
Um, so again, just emphasizing that repeat violations can be more easily issued than willful violations. They are more common than willful violations and it should just be factored into how an employer decides to respond to a set of citations, whether they decide to contest with you know, the thought in the back of their mind that if they do not contest and this violation goes on their record, what could that mean in the future for you know, potential repeat violations? Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Eric to talk about OSHA enforcement under Biden. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, we'll cover these, oh, these last few slides pretty uh, quickly here. Um, this is just an overview of things that we expect to see out of OSHA from an enforcement standpoint uh, over the course of you know, the balance of the next few years. Um, we've already seen a significant boost in OSHA's budget, both from the um, COVID relief legislation, but also just in the, the first year budget, uh, fiscal year budget um, that was uh, that was approved uh, by Congress, um, it showed a, a significant increase in OSHA's budget that they're using for enforcement programs. Um, one thing that we had flagged for something to watch out for, I think we talked about this in some detail in last January's webinar was, hey, we now have Democratic control of the House and the Senate and a Democrat in the White House. Is this the year or is this the, the term in which we're going to see some real movement in the Protecting America's Workers Act, which is the big OSH Act reform legislation that would increase penalties, would increase criminality, uh, increase you know, potential targets for criminal charges, all sorts of um, uh, really sharpening of OSHA's teeth. Um, we, we put it on this slide because we still do have um, uh, single party control of Congress and the White House, but it's not looking like this is a priority, especially with everything else going on with COVID and some of the other, uh, the, the Biden administration's other priorities like voting rights and and um, and the uh, infrastructure and build back better uh, legislation. Uh, it, this is probably not going to happen, but if we get surprised um, at the midterm elections uh, later this year and there is still Democratic control or growing Democratic control in Congress, this is something that we're going to be paying close attention to. Um, you know, the, to, to watch out for. Uh, one of the other major things that we are fully expecting to see is a big focus on heat illness. And we're going to talk about the heat illness rulemaking that is underway now. And maybe many of you are joining us for a discussion about our coalition to work on the heat illness rulemaking later this afternoon. But there's also a big focus on heat illness from an enforcement standpoint uh, right now. They have, uh, they have issued a new enforcement directive which requires compliance officers whenever they are in a workplace for any reason, not just because they're there for a heat illness complaint or heat illness concern, they are to evaluate whether there are heat illness risks. Do they see strenuous work in high heat conditions? And if so, to evaluate compliance, general duty clause compliance with uh, recognized practices to address heat illness. And OSHA is working on a national emphasis program right now to focus on heat illness which we expect to see issued sometime in 2022, which will drive a bunch of programmed inspections uh, in certain industries that have um, uh, more prevalent uh, issues with heat illness, construction, other outdoor work uh, activities. Uh, so heat illness we know is a high priority for the Biden administration, for the senior leaders that have been appointed at OSHA. Um, and they're, they're, they're tackling that both from an enforcement standpoint now and a rulemaking standpoint we'll talk about in just a second. Um, we expect to see continued effort by this administration advancing what began during the Obama administration and which frankly continued during the Trump administration, which is to find and prosecute more worker safety criminal um, situations. Uh, even without uh, a, an, an amendment to the OSH Act, uh, the Department of Justice has gotten creative in finding ways to pair worker safety crimes with environmental crimes. Uh, and to otherwise just make a personal commit or administrative commitment or a department commitment to find and prosecute more worker safety cases, even though they are still now misdemeanor charges that tend to only be brought or, um, or, or can only be brought against companies, uh, against individuals in rare circumstances at the federal level, but they're doing more and as much as they can. Uh, we know that this administration is going to redouble 
uh, the efforts that began uh, during the Obama administration to highlight whistleblower uh, retaliation, 11C actions under the OSH Act, um, uh, cre you know, creating a new division um, uh, to handle that during the Obama administration, increasing the funding for that during the Biden administration is a, a clear objective. And we expect to see a lot more activity on that front. Uh, we expect to see a lot more enforcement in the process safety industries as well um, during the uh, Biden administration. At the um, very end of the Obama administration, the beginning of the Trump administration, the agency launched a chemical facilities and petroleum refining, uh, refining PSM national emphasis program, but it sort of sat on ice during the Trump administration. They were doing inspections but not, um, uh, not at the rate that they are expected to, and they seem to not be as robust uh, as the Obama administration's OSHA indicated that they would be. We anticipate that that will pick back up at least as we begin to move um, or get the pandemic more and more under control. Then we expect to see a refocus on very robust enforcement in the process safety industries, refining and uh, chemical manufacturing. And then finally, um, we've already seen a resurgence in regulation by shaming the, uh, the, OSHA, uh, the OSHA's um, negative uh, antagonistic enforcement press releases. And I think uh, Aaron is going to talk a little bit about that here. Yep. Thanks, Eric. Um, and, and I won't rehash what we've covered. And I know I'm kind of stealing your thunder since this is usually your slide, but um, I won't rehash what we generally cover, which is like many things, when when between Republican and Democratic administrations, you see some pretty stark differences, and this is one area uh, that 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 is certainly the case um, during uh, the Bush and Trump administrations. You see uh, fewer press releases. The press releases that are issued tend to be very factual, uh, just stating uh, the name of the company, some brief description of what happened. The amount of the, the types of citations, number of citations, overall penalty, and that's that was pretty much it. Um, then uh, during the Obama administration, you saw, as Eric talked about, this this approach to regulation by shaming, something that was really um, a, a big focus with uh, Dr. David Michaels, and you saw some pretty inflammatory quotes from DOL officials. Um, depending on, in, in, in my experience, the more significant the, the incident or, or issue, the higher level person. Uh, so sometimes it'd be the area director, it was a, a mass casualty event or a plant explosion. You might see the regional, regional administrator or possibly even someone from, from the national office. And some of those, uh, some of those quotes were, were pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary in terms of what they said. They almost appeared to be Written by uh, you know someone who who had a, a, a desire to to go to Hollywood with uh, you know writing a, a script for for a tearjerker movie, um, and what I've seen and 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 as Eric said, I've already seen a number of, of pretty inflammatory uh, one one in particular that that uh, really caught my attention uh, that kind of played up you know, what what happened to somebody uh, during leading up to I think it was the, leading up to the holidays and that they were family was planning their burial instead of instead of celebrating the holidays with that person or something along those lines but it, it I think consistent with what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of even even though there's this this heavier union emphasis and focus on uh, employee representatives that there seems to be a little bit more discretion um, I, I don't see the inflammatory quotes in, in as many press releases this could just be personal experience on the matters that I've worked on I, I, I feel like that the, the area offices have some discretion as far as if they feel that the employer uh, is is concerned and, and cooperating and taking appropriate steps to correct potential hazards during the inspection, that you're less likely to to see negative quotes. Uh, and in, in, in fact, in some cases, perhaps even avoid a press release entirely. Um, if you've been in this process, you know that the standard response is we don't negotiate press release content. We don't negotiate whether a press release will issue. But I've had discussions with, with local area offices and in, in, in pretty significant inspections where um, kind of made our clients' the desires known. Um, and I think because of the way the inspection went forward, uh, they were comfortable not issuing a press release. So 
I, I feel like a big part of it is going to be that perception that they have of the employer and whether they think that the press release is needed to, uh, to, to kind of beat you into compliance if you're not showing a, a willingness to comply, even if there was a problem. Um, so we'll be watching this issue closely and, and, and tracking those press releases. And hopefully next year, we won't have too many examples of, of really egregious language, but I'm sure there will be some. Uh, and so with that, I think uh, turning it over now to, uh, to Micah. All right, uh, we're going to switch from enforcement to rulemaking uh, and take a quick trip through uh, this list of the top 10 list of what we think are uh, likely priorities of the Biden administration. Uh, the focus here is just going to be giving you an update on where things stand. Does this uh, effort exist in, in real life or is it um, just a goal? So with that, we'll kick it off. Number one, the permanent infectious diseases rule. Uh, I think that this is something that's been on um, the rulemaking agenda since maybe 2010. So it's definitely something that OSHA has wanted to do since even back in the Obama administration. Um, the, the pandemic has certainly raised this um, to the front of um, the, the agency's mind and, and shows up as something that they could do uh, perhaps before the next pandemic, whenever that is, uh, as something that could be useful and, and give them some, some enforcement tools uh, if, if we encounter that again. Um, right now, uh, looking at the, um, uh, at the regulatory agenda, there's no impending action here. We think that this is probably going to follow uh, it, it may be kind of a, a follow-up uh, with the permanent COVID rule. It may be related to it. It's, uh, OSHA's got a lot of options on what they can do with it and where they can go. But uh, I think we think we're seeing uh, some elements that could be in it um, in some of the COVID ETS um, rules. So um, that's definitely something we're going to be watching, but I don't think we're going to see this one land until we're clear of the pandemic. Uh, the second one here is uh, workplace violence uh, in the healthcare sector. Uh, this is something that's been a, definitely been a focus of OSHA. Um, it is listed as in the pre-rule stage, um, and there was a 2016 RFI issued here. Uh, there's currently no impending action, but uh, this is uh, another one that has all uh, been high on the priority list for quite a while. Um, and I think we're just waiting for OSHA to get some breathing room to, to, to be able to take action on this. So I think we'll see this happen. Uh, certainly in the next couple of years. Third one is emergency response. This one is probably the most active of any, or maybe maybe not quite the most active. Uh, it's listed as in the pre-rule stage, uh, initiated back in, I think, 2016 with a NACOSH report. Um, there is a, a Sabrief uh, uh, report that was just issued last month. So we're, we're seeing this m move along a little bit. Uh, I have not personally dug into the uh, report yet, um, but we at least know that there's you know, some information going back to OSHA. Uh, so I think there's there's room for OSHA to take a next step here. Number four, revisiting um, Trump OSHA's rollback of e-record keeping. You'll recall that uh, the tail end of the Obama administration, there was the e-record keeping rule, which would require the submission of a lot more information directly to OSHA and then the publication of that. Uh, OSHA during uh, the Trump administration rolled back most of the, the publication requirements and also the collection of some of that information. Uh, right now, there's nothing on the regulatory agenda here. Um, we think that this is probably something that will be a, a, a goal, something the administration will do. I think we've seen some statements along those lines. Uh, but at this point, I don't think there's anything, uh, any active measures along these lines. Uh, with that said, uh, because it's a, uh, it's a regulation, not a standard, um, OSHA is able to move much faster on these things. So if OSHA does decide to do something here, it, it can happen a lot more, more quickly than it does with a substantive standard. Uh, number five, heat illness rulemaking. And this is something that the rulemaking has actually been initiated. So I'll pass this back to Eric to uh, give us some, uh, a more substantive update on this. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this because we've done a separate program on it. We formed a coalition to work on this rulemaking. I invite everybody who's, who may be interested uh, to participate in that to let me know. Uh, but just the long and short of it is this is an extremely high priority of this administration. You know, I, I think if we were not dealing with the pandemic, we would have seen a lot more aggressive uh, activity on this in the first year. But even with the pandemic, we did see this interagency effort uh, kickoff that announced multiple things, including 
the enforcement initiative I mentioned before, the national emphasis program I mentioned before that's coming soon, and they kicked off a heat illness rulemaking with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Comments are due to that, uh, due on that advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which included something like 100, 115 questions about existing programs that uh, employers have, uh, feasibility issues, uh, indoor versus outdoor uh, heat illness rules, um, uh, pros and cons and, and, and complications of that sort of thing, uh, types of administrative and engineering controls that, that could work, that are, that are effective, that are feasible. Uh, and we're working hard on comments on that right now. We're convening our, our coalition group this afternoon to talk about that. Uh, but that's going to be, um, I, I think, aggressive work over the next three years um, and uh, by this administration, I, obviously they're not going to be able, I shouldn't say obviously, it would be shocking if they completed a rule during this term. Um, and there may not be a second term, but they're going to move as quickly as they can uh, on this rulemaking. And so this is something certainly to pay attention to uh, over the, the course of the next uh, year or three. All right, back to our top 10. Uh, number six, uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, uh, the resumption of PSM reform rulemaking. Uh, this effort kicked off uh, back in late 2013 after the West Texas explosion. Um, OSHA and EPA were both directed to um, work on some reforms. Uh, OSHA didn't make it very far before the end of the Obama administration. EPA did. Uh, the, that saga of the, of the RMP uh, amendments is, is a long and interesting one. Uh, at least for people like me. Um, but where we stand on this is it's listed on the regulatory agenda as uh, in the pre-rule stage. Um, we wouldn't think um, on the surface that there's much to talk about here, that there's much coming, but what we've learned in conversations with folks at the agency is that this is something that they definitely want to get done. Um, but I think they're also going to be driven uh, because EPA is being more active on this one. Um, this past summer, um, EPA did some listening sessions related to RMP. OSHA participated in those as a as a listener also, but uh, we know that there's a lot more under the surface than there might appear to be here. So, so we think we'll, we'll see something on this in the fairly near future. Uh, number seven, uh, setting lower chemical pels and action levels. Uh, I would list this as a perennial goal of the agency. Uh, they know that they have uh, very outdated pels and action levels. Um, Many of the the, the, the TLDs, um, uh, the, the industry groups have, have lowered their their levels, um, permissible levels. So um, OSHA is out of step with with everyone else and knows they need to catch up with it. Uh, but there are there are lots of reasons this would be a very very difficult rulemaking to do. They're going to need a lot of science, um, probably a lot of um, uh, illness data to to be able to make this work. So we know they want to do it. Uh, it's hard to say whether they'll get to it or not. Number eight, updating HASCOM. Uh, this one's listed as the uh, being in the proposed rule stage. Uh, we don't have a whole lot to say on this uh, because um, we're the the HASCOM rule has been aligned with the, the GHS system. Um, it, this is driven less by OSHA's maybe desire to update it than it is just a need to catch up. Uh, so um, the GHS has been revised uh, I think five times since it was last updated. So OSHA's behind on this. They're going to do it. Um, there may be some significant changes in there. I'm not, uh, or actually our firm's expert on the substance there. So we'll be keeping an eye on that to see what there is interesting. But we know that OSHA's feeling uh, out of step with the rest of the world and wants to get updated here. So we think we'll see action here. Number nine, modernizing lotto and cutting uh, unexpected energization trigger. Um, there is a, uh, this is listed as being in the proposed rule stage, and there's a 2018 RFI uh, related to lockout tagout. It really focuses on uh, electronic controls um, because the current lockout rule doesn't really allow for um, electronic systems to be used as part of a lockout. They want a hard um, cutoff of, of energy. And so uh, they know that it's an old rule and that there may be room for changing it there. Uh, it will be very, very interesting to see where they go with this. Uh, anytime you open up an old rule, uh, there's there's room to make changes sometimes more broad than were identified in the RFI. So um, uh, we know OSHA wants to make some changes here, and this is they've got a, a essentially an open rulemaking where they can do it. So we will keep a close eye on this. Last one is uh, revisit the uh, the um, the CRA repeal of the Volks rule, which um, 
was issued back in the Obama administration, extend the statute of limitations for record keeping violations all the way up to five years. Uh, this is a tricky one. It's conceptual only at this point, and there are some major obstacles to OSHA doing this. Uh, primarily that with the, the CRA having been used to roll it back, uh, OSHA can't just go reissue the same rule. Uh, they would have to work around that in some way. It might require congressional action, or it might just require a different tack uh, by the agency. So um, right now with six month statute of limitations, uh, you all probably know it's very difficult for OSHA to cite uh, record keeping violations. Um, and so they, they would like to have this tool back in their arsenal. So we know it's something they want to do, uh, but the way to get to it is, is still unclear. Uh, and that's where we stand uh, in terms of rulemaking priorities. And I think that takes us to the end of the substantive uh, part of our program. Eric, do you want to see us out? Sure. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to check out our COVID-19 resources. Uh, this is something that has lived on our website longer than we had hoped, but we continue to update it with uh, a new comprehensive set of FAQs about OSHA's new vaccination ETS, some COVID-19 record keeping guidance and other useful uh, articles and webinars and interesting uh, information about COVID-19. Along those same lines, I encourage everyone to join us for the rest of the webinars in our 2022 OSHA webinar series. This is the current plan and schedule. Uh, just like last year, we would not be terribly surprised to see uh, a, a few uh, bonus programs thrown into the mix uh, over the course of the year as, uh, as things change and evolve and develop. This is the plan, and if you want to register for all, you can send a note and just ask to be added to each of these programs, and you'll get, uh, we'll, we'll take care of getting you registered. I encourage you to do that. And then lastly, uh, check out our blogs, the OSHA Defense Report. Uh, which used to be, you know, one or two little updates uh, every month has become something of a novella over the last couple of years. And we're trying hard to keep everybody updated as things are constantly changing by the CDC, by OSHA, by the courts. Um, and we're doing that on the OSHA front, on the labor and employment law front, and in Cal OSHA uh, in particular. So check out our blogs um, and don't hesitate to uh, to reach out and ask us any questions. The fact that we are now at 20 minutes or almost 20 minutes past the hour, I think what we're gonna do is address uh, as many of your questions as we can by email uh, following this. But if there's a, a really important question that we did not answer uh, after you put it into the chat function, um, I'd encourage you to reach out to us, just shoot us an email and we're happy to um, either jump on a call with you or shoot you an email with uh, with our best guess, which is often what we're doing in, in this context these days. But thank you everybody for joining us and, um, and we look forward to another um, you know, really fun year with these webinars. We really enjoyed doing this. Uh, it's a great way for us to, to stay on top of developments in this space. Um, and we wanna hear from you, you know, as we um, move from year to year and develop our program schedule, we like to uh, uh, develop programs that are things that you're interested in. So share feedback about that. And, um, and we'd love to be a resource for you in general. So please don't hesitate to reach out about COVID-19 compliance or other OSHA compliance issues. Um, uh, and, and we're here for you. So thanks everybody and uh, happy new year.